I was doing a comic book, as you know, about a black American guy in Russia. It was a fictional story, Festicon Zero. I, I, I sent it to you, right? Yeah. Years yeah, ago. And at the time, I was obsessed with Claude McKay, who spent a lot of time in, in the Soviet Union. And I had created this fictional character who kind of falls in love with Claude McKay. It's, it's ambiguous whether it's a sexual love or just a sort of artistic love. And the, the, my character is really problematic in that he's also a serial killer. But anyway, that's that's a whole other thing. And then uh, that whole book was just following real life Black American people who had been in the Soviet Union from like 1922 to 1945. So I was reading Claude McKay. I was reading Langston Hughes, who had also been there for a little bit. Paul Robeson's accounts of being there. And I come across Emma Harris, who I think in Hughes' book had a band called the Louisiana Amazon Gods. That's how I read it which I thought was the coolest name ever. More research, you find out that it was guards most of the time, Louisiana Amazon guards. And I did the comic and Emma Harris kind of played this cursory figure. Um, in fact, I never ended up doing that part of the comic, you know, in terms of actually laying it out with all the graphics and everything. I wrote the story, but the graphics, I only got my character to Russia, as you well remember, Tom. Anyway, and then, and then my character meets Emma Harris, who kind of functioned like the Bricktop Smith of Russia. Bricktop Smith was a black woman here in Paris who really facilitated a lot of meet and greets and all great black American minds and musicians and creatives would end up at her place at one time or another. And Emma Harris served a similar purpose in Russia, which is why you hear about her and Claude McKay's work and, and, and Langston Hughes' work. I'm looking down the road, Paris, I can see. Emma Harris's story is even more epic than I knew. You know, first of all, she ends up in Brooklyn, marries a Harris, and her first child dies. She's already singing. It was like late 1890s. She's singing. So, you know, a lot of the songs are religious in nature. Her child dies. She concentrates on singing. And then she sees an ad looking for Black American singers to get them together to do the singing troupe. So the Louisiana Amazon guards sort of get cobbled together by this German impresario. They tour all over Europe. She sees the Bloody Sunday when the czars, you know, flip out and, and kill the sort of proto-Bolsheviks in front of the Kremlin. She ends up being caught up in the Russo-Japanese War, like all the way on the other side of Russia. She comes back, she tours all over Russia. They change the name of the group. With, you know, the Louisiana Amazon guards just disband Realize that they've been exploited by this person. Sue that person. All the different women. What kind of music do I need to picture them in? That's a good question. Somewhere between ragtime and gospel. Really early, early jazz. And I'm, I'm sure some people would argue whether it's jazz or not. Who knows? What I really like about this person is all the stuff she went through. And she, the other thing, though, is she's part of a tradition. She's not the first Black American woman to end up settling in Russia in 1823. Nancy Prince, who was someone I studied in college, because she wrote this, another, she just wrote a totally epic narrative. How are Russians looking at Black people in the early 1900s? Early 19th century, it was very in vogue in Russia in Tsar's court to have a few Black people around because it looked cool, essentially. And they didn't have to be servants. It wasn't a situation of servitude, not necessarily. It wasn't, wasn't a uh, egalitarian situation, that's for sure. It was problematic. But uh, for example, Nancy Prince finds herself a free woman in Russia, marries a member of the Tsarist court and appreciates a, a, a certain level of, of status that she absolutely never would have appreciated in the US. You know, just the Tsarists themselves find that interesting. There's two things. One, it's rare to see a Black person in St. Petersburg in Moscow. Not unheard of. Rare, so there's not that sort of animosity that comes like you have in Sweden now, where people are like, I was never racist until the Black person moved in next door, and now I realize I'm racist. Sorry for the accent. It's not Swedish. But also, you know, Russia's a diverse place in regards to, you know, all of the Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan. So there's already different types of people. And then there's proof of... Uh, people of African origin living in the Caucasus Mountains. So there was brown-skinned people around. They certainly hadn't engaged in violent anti-Black slavery at the same level that Western Europe has. There were certainly Russian private companies that 
made a great deal of money off of slavery. All of Europe made money off of slavery one way or the other. But it wasn't a major industry. It wasn't propelling uh, the economy in the same way that it did for uh, France and Spain and, uh, and England and Belgium and the Netherlands. So, so it was a very different relationship. And then also after the Bolshevik Revolution, you know, a big part of Lenin's plan, Trotsky's plan in particular, you know, was this whole idea of the international, you know, this is an international movement, which means everyone's included. And so diversity wasn't in vogue, it was, it was mandated that people of all nations would be celebrated for very specific sort of almost Machiavellian reasons. For example, there was a, the Soviet Union was very interested in depicting the difficulties of being African-American because it made for good anti-American propaganda. So they were thrilled when Claude McKay came over, when Langston Hughes came over. And when you read those people's writings, you find out that they quickly realized that they were being exploited to tell a certain story for um, national purposes and not necessarily there just being embraced for who they are. Uh, so it's always a complicated relationship. But it, it's interesting to look at all that in the context of Russia now, which is sort of celebrated as white supremacists, as the ultimate bigots, you know, <laughs> we're like, you know. Emma definitely enjoyed her time there. There's actually a point where she's thinking about going back to the United States. She gets caught up in the Russo-Japanese War, is in prison for a moment, and a U.S. State Department official comes and, and frees the Americans who are there and is totally upset that she's black. And so she clearly realizes that, no, you know, going back to the United States is not going to be a good option. And no, so she stays and she and she does well. Not only does she do well, when the Bolshevik Revolution happened, you know, at this point, she's been consorting with all different people, of all different class strata. The Bolsheviks, actually, she gets a pretty good apartment in Russia. You know, the whole entire economic system changes, so she can't necessarily make money the same way she used to. I forget it, if it's in the Langston Hughes book or the or the Claude McKay Most Way Home, you know, but they talk about how her apartment compared to a lot of other people living in Moscow at the time was pretty nice. But she was also sort of free to speak and critique the Bolsheviks and 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 later on Stalin. You know, the people there's accounts of her being in her apartment being like, Yeah, Stalin doesn't know what he's doing. You know, having an open critique of him, which wasn't necessarily an easy thing to do. I hadn't really researched her for about, you know, a couple of years. And now there's all this 10 times more stuff on online about her. Someone's probably writing a screenplay. I should write the damn screenplay. And whoever watches this, let's all just try and write the screenplay. We'll just do a race to get the screenplay done. <laughs> but I... <laughs>